Welcome back to chapter one, where we have the second half of our lecture for this chapter. Now, in this particular video, we are going to describe how unit conversions can be made tougher and then see several different examples that each have their own video where we go through step by step how to solve them. So the most important thing to recognize so far is that we have introduced the basic strategy for going about solving unit conversions. We talked about this as the train tracks method. And if you are more comfortable with a different method, please feel free to use the method that you've seen before. But in a lot of cases, this is the first time that students have um, been exposed to doing complex unit conversions. And this is the method that we, that we focus on so that things can be as straightforward and organized as possible when you are trying to do these on your own. Now, there are two main ways that these unit conversions get tougher. The first is when there is more than one starting unit. So for example, if we think about speed limits, speed limits, the unit is always in miles per hour here in the US. So if the speed limit is 70 miles per hour, we want to turn that into standard units. Instead of miles, our standard length unit is meters. And instead of hours, our standard time unit is seconds. So our goal is to get 70 miles per hour in units of meters per second. Now, the most important thing to point out on this example is that the word per has very specific meaning here. What it means is what we have is a fractional unit in a sense. Miles should go on the top of the starting point, but hours should go on the bottom, miles per hour. So what that means then is when we start this unit conversion on the far left, we see that 70 miles is on the top and hours is on the bottom. The most common mistake in that case is students try to just shove miles per hour into the top as a single unit idea. And that word per has that specific meaning of this thing goes on the bottom, 70 miles per hour. By having two different units to convert, we have to treat each one of them separately in either order. But for example, the first thing we attach to this train tracks, although it doesn't quite look like the train tracks, it's still the same idea. The first conversion factor we um, put in was going from miles to meters then miles we could cancel on the top and the bottom. And if you're writing this out in your notes, physically crossing it out um, when it shows up on the top and the bottom is a really good idea. Um, so then we have meters. And because meters is one of our ending quantities, we can just circle it and remind ourselves that there's nothing else to do for that portion. So we head back to the hours. Because hour shows up on the bottom, when we add another unit conversion piece, one hour is equal to 60 minutes, hours has to show up on the top in order for it to cancel. It has to show up in equal amounts on the top and the bottom to cross it out. So then 60 minutes is on the bottom, and so to get rid of minutes, we have to have one minute on the top and 60 seconds on the bottom. And then we end up with our final answer. Meters per second can also be written as meters slash second because that's what per is trying to tell us. It is worth, if you have your calculator in front of you, to pause the video and make sure that you type this into your calculator the way that you think it should be and verify that you get the answer that we do. Because this is another situation where another common mistake that students make is not putting parentheses around the bottom so that when they're typing this into their calculator, 60 and 60 don't both get divided the way that we expect them to. Putting parentheses around that is going to help out with that, and it will get our expected answer of about 30 meters per second. Okay. The other way that um, units can get a little bit tougher is when we're talking about volume and area units. Far too often, not just in chapter one, but all throughout the semester, if students read too quickly, they just ignore the words cubic or squared as if those words have no meaning. 
And this is probably the single most common student error in chapter one. Even when students feel confident in doing unit conversions, volume and area tends to be the place where they get a little too confident or don't practice enough, and then it becomes a real problem later on. So for example, these two here, convert one cubic meter into cubic centimeters. A cubic meter is not 100 cubic centimeters. One regular meter is equal to one regular, 100 regular centimeters. But a cubic meter is one meter side to side, one meter front to back, and one meter up and down. There are way more than just 100 cubic centimeters in that area. On the next slide, we'll see how quite how many cubic centimeters are in that volume. And then square, when we see that show up, we're talking about area. So 2.5 square meters, we want to know how many square feet are in that. In the previous set of slides from the first half of chapter one, we can find the unit conversion of 3.281 feet is equal to one meter. But that is for feet to meter, not for square feet to square meters. So keep that in mind. The way that we approach these is by recognizing that when we have cubic in front of the unit, it means the unit shows up three times. The number is the number. I see way too many students that cube the number somehow and don't recognize that the cubic word is just on the unit. So let's see what that looks like. On the top, a cubic meter is one meter cubed which means it's one meter times a meter times a meter. The one is there only once, but the unit shows up three times. But in order to fully cancel it then, we need the conversion factor meters to centimeters to show up three separate times. A lot of students try to cut corners and just write it and write that whole portion cubed. That is not going to help you understand how it works and the small amount of time saved writing is not going to save you time when you are making mistakes and losing points later in the semester. It is by far best to actively write out every single um, conversion factor. That is what you will see us do every time we post solutions. It is the um, best practice. So one cubic meter is actually one million cubic centimeters. 10 to the 6 is a million cubic centimeters. We tend to have trouble as human beings thinking about volume units in the right way because we don't use those as often in everyday life as we do with length units. And then for um, the second one, 2.5 square meters is 2.5 just once, but the meters shows up twice because it's squared. And then we multiply by the conversion factor, not once, but twice because we're dealing with an area unit, square meters instead of just regular meters. And on top it was cubic meters instead of just regular meters. And we end up with 27 square feet. It is worth uh, making a note to yourself to at some point, uh, maybe a couple of days from now, just looking back at slide 18, and trying those again on your own, and then comparing to the solutions here um, to make sure that you are on the right track here, that you understand how to, un how to interpret cubic and square when it shows up. Okay, now, the examples that I'm going to read out here, I'm not going to solve in this lecture video. They will have their own separate example video where I go through step by step and explain how we go about solving this, the process. I describe a couple of the common mistakes that students tend to make. I comment on some of the common sticking points. And so I don't want to have that all in this one lecture video. And this also gives you a chance that if you feel already pretty confident with um, this skill because unit conversion is not specific to physics. It shows up in lots of different science courses. And if you've taken, for example, chemistry before, 
then this is probably a skill that you already have um, some familiarity with. This gives you a chance to try these examples first and then kind of go through those example videos a little bit faster and see if what you've done already is on the right track. That is the best way about going, the best way of going about these if you are feeling confident is to try them before you watch the video. But if this really is a new, um, a new skill for you, these example videos are going to show you start to finish how they work. And then you can follow along and start to get a better understanding of the process by seeing it in action several times. Okay, so the first example that will have its own video is a painter can paint 4.5 square feet in one minute. How many square meters can they paint in one hour? A reminder for the train tracks method, the first thing that we want to do is identify our starting point. Our starting point here is 4.5 square feet per minute. And our ending units, our target, is square meters per hour. So we'll see how that plays out in that separate example video. The next one that has its own video. A jet can travel 280 yards on a gallon of fuel. Find the gallons needed to go 2,000 kilometers. This is the first time where we have two different number values in the problem as it is presented. In our process, we have always started with the number and unit that we were given and gone from there. In this case, we have to recognize that one of these things is a conversion factor that we are given in full for this particular jet. 280 yards is equal to one gallon of fuel for this specific problem, not in a general worldwide sense. And so that's a conversion factor we'll use, and 2,000 kilometers is our starting point for it. This third example, if a typical heart rate is 65 beats per minute, estimate the number of heartbeats someone will have in 70 years. We will talk about here how 70 years is our starting point, and 65 beats per minute, although it feels like a rate, can also be written as a conversion factor. One minute of time is equal to 65 heartbeats. And we can use that as a conversion factor instead of a starting point. And then the fourth example that we will have an, a full separate video for, each one has its own video, is if your car is traveling 70 miles per hour, how long will it take your car to travel 50 feet? And just like with the heartbeat rate, the speed that your car is driving is true about the problem in general, whether we're going 50 feet or whether we're going 50 um, yards. And so 70 miles per hour is really should be treated like a conversion factor. Your car is able to turn 70 miles into one hour. And that way of thinking about speed as a conversion factor is one that we actually do in everyday language. If we talk about, for example, going to Detroit. We can talk about the number of miles, but often we talk about that it's a two hour trip because in our head, we're already doing that conversion between the fact that we know we're driving a car that has a typical range of speeds and we're on highways that whole time. We're already doing that kind of conversion in our heads using speed as that conversion factor. So although this might be the first time we've had to think about it in this very specific quantitative kind of way, I do want to point out that it's something that in the back of our minds, we, we already do fairly, fairly easily without thinking about it. The trick is to do it just as easily while also thinking about it. So to wrap up the lecture video so that you'll be able to see those example videos next is that as you will start to see in each of these examples, there is a single process that will always lead us down the right path. And the most important thing I can convey for each chapter that we see, there is basically an overarching process that if we understand that process, we can attack every single new situation that has a similar um, setup. And so 
by noticing the underlying similarities, instead of focusing on this one was a speed and this one was a volume, by noticing the underlying similarities, you'll be able to better read the situation in a way that we will have to build a skill for eventually. And so the sooner that you feel confident doing that, the better. So as you go through these, either before you watch the example videos or as you're watching the example videos, try to take note of the similarities. The fact that every single example that we've already done, the simple ones, and the ones that have those example videos, the harder ones, use the same steps. We figure out what we start with, we figure out what our target is, and the way that we go from point A to point B is through a set of train tracks where we write our starting quantity and then add conversion factors that are leading us down the path to our destination. The way that we can make sure that we're doing the right thing is by looking at our units. We can cross out units that appear in equal amounts on the top and the bottom. The reason why every single time I've mentioned equal amounts is because of this idea of area units and volume units. If we have cubic meters on top, we need meters to show up three different times on the bottom. If we have square feet on top, we need feet units to show up twice on the bottom. And then that last step, um, as I mentioned before, is the, um, the math part, but it's actually not the focus of our course. The focus of our course is problem solving and understanding what's going on. Our calculator, Doing things with all of those numbers is useful to get the final value, but it's not actually the goal of the course itself. The goal of the course is for us to know why we take these steps, what these steps are trying to tell us, and get comfortable with that process. A couple of keys here is you're always going to want to start your beginning quantity on the far left and just kind of add to it as you go. Anything added to the train tracks has to equal one. And what that means is we have to be using valid conversion factors. 12 inches is one foot. We can't just put six inches and one foot because inches and feet are connected. We have to use the appropriate conversion factor so that the top is equal to the bottom. Cross out units, like I said, physically crossing them out as they show up on the top and the bottom is a good process for understanding why we do what we do, that you're actually seeing that they do cancel out in some cases and don't cancel out in the others. The places where they don't cancel will be your final units. And then the single most important math um, thing to be aware of is you need to use parentheses when you're doing that final step of multiplying everything together. All right. So um, really the single big problem type that comes out of chapter one is unit conversions. And those four examples that have their own video show us the level that we need to be able to be comfortable with. That will take some practice to, to get there, but that's really the key quantitative problem type that comes out of this chapter. The idea of what physics is, what units are, the standard um, system of units. Those are concepts that are helpful to come out of this chapter. And the last Single slide I'll have here that I want to point out as part of chapter one is the idea of accuracy compared to precision. That is a conversation that is um, going to be a much bigger focus of the lab portion of this course compared to the lecture portion. But I do want to point out the difference between those two words to make sure that we're fully on board with the fact that accuracy and precision have different meanings in words. If we look at these four targets, on if we look at each one of these and imagine being in an archery contest, the far left is the archer who is the best. Everyone would agree, all of the judges would agree that the person on the far left has done the best job. All of their shots are grouped together and all of their shots are in the center of the target. The second archer in line here, where the shots are not that closely grouped together, but they are still focused on the target, that still earns a lot of points. That second archer is accurate, they are shooting in the right place, 
but they aren't as precise. They don't have um, their arrows as closely grouped together. The third archer is one that is not scoring very many points at all, even though it seems like they know what they're doing. Their shots are all very closely um, put together, very precise, but they aren't shooting at the center of the target. They are not accurate. And then the fourth archer um, probably needs to do a little bit more practicing before the next tournament. Their shots are not focused on the target, so they're not accurate, and they are very widely spaced, and so they are not very precise. So in terms of the use of these two terms in lab, you will see that in your lab section, but in terms of recognizing that there is a fundamental difference between accuracy and precision, and the more important one is accuracy, um, that's something that we can at least comment on here, and you're welcome to read section 1.3 of the textbook um, to get a little bit more detail there as well. The other thing to note here is that this is also the part of the course, or the part of the textbook where significant figures are introduced. That will be something that we spend a lot of time on in the first two labs, um, and we will comment on it as we start to get into chapter two a little bit more, um, but I don't want to introduce it in this, in this spot when lab will be the place where you learn all of the different rules for significant figures um, and work with them and practice with them. So this is the second of two lecture videos for chapter one, but we have those four example videos that will show us that problem solving in action. So I will see you in those example videos.